Did we get it all? I think so. Okay. Now let's see if it recorded. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh my God. Please, please. <laughs> Do you want premium ad-free content? Duh. Content that's not censored by big tech, of course. Well, with SD Insider, you can get behind the scenes and a whole lot more. Link in the description. What's up, FTFers? I'm sitting here with my good friend, Mike Simmons, and we are out in the field testing gear today. And why would you test gear to begin with? Because you wanna know what the gear is gonna do before you get out there and it leaves you stranded. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And so we just got back from the Silver Wolves event down in Alabama, Blackie Thomas's event. And that, that event really got me thinking. Okay. Like hard, because we were dealing with people in a demographic that were 50 years and up. While we were down there, I got challenged. Like, can you come up with a kit that's below 20 pounds? Right, that's the magic number. I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there with ultralight and everything, but I think there's there's a definite change once you go above, especially 25 pounds. And so we, we wanna to try to get that 20 pound magical number. <laughs> and I think that that's, I think it's doable, Yeah. first of all, but it has required a ton of planning and I'm not gonna get into what I've got in my kit just yet because I haven't worked out and ironed out all the details just yet. Okay, but that's a preview, like, watch for that upcoming video it's coming because I, i'm not one to step back from a challenge so i definitely wanted to see <laughs> all right can we be the first ones to you know go below that 20 pound mark and it still be versatile uh still be uh multifunctional right and and work in a variety of environments and different situations and you're not trading you're not trading weight for suffering that's one of the things we want to try to do we want to hit that mark and still not increase our level of suffering. Exactly. Right, because the whole point is to mitigate suffering. To mitigate it. Yeah, so that got me thinking, because I've had to go through kit mentality to, to make this kit happen, right. and I, I just want to kind of talk today about the fallacies of survival. Oh boy, yeah. That's a big yeah. one. Yep. And this is something that you're really good at putting into words. Like a lot of you probably okay. have this idea out there but this is the guy that can actually put it into terms <laughs> to make it grunt proof or kindergarten proof right, or, or right. whatever you want yeah. to call it. Mama had a way of explaining things I could understand it. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and so I figured while I had you here, because we're in between events, we're about to go to Georgia Bushcraft. Right. And I, my goal anyway is to run this kit at Georgia Bushcraft. Okay. To see if I can, if I can make it happen or not. Right. But let's go ahead and, and dive into that. So. Let's talk fallacies of survival. What, what do you think is the number one fallacy of survival? Not to be confused with survival myths. Correct, and we need to understand the, the different definition and terminology. We chose the word fallacy for a reason. And the, the, the top number one fallacy that I see out there is, well, it's better than nothing. Better than nothing. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Right. And I mean, we hear it all the time. I've, Events, gatherings, classes online it's everywhere yeah. you know and and people think well you know it, it's better than nothing and you're really setting yourself up for a bad time with for that. failure with that right because right. uh the best survival knife is the knife that you have right until you until you get ready you go you baton you go dum 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 ding, ding. <laughs> you know but um, i think today in today's survival world because it goes in cycles so right now batoning is not cool Okay. Whereas it used to be is cool. It, is that what the cool kids yeah, are talking no, about? No, the cool kids are not doing batonic anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. But I'm going to say, just to add to that point, that if I want to, I want my knife to be right. able to do it. Right. And that's why when we come to the next fallacy, we talk about building in redundancy of items into our kit, but we never talk about a buffer of adequacy. Oh, that's a good one right there. Now, so, typically in a duty cycle, uh, any piece of gear, any any mechanical thing, I only ask about 60% of its maximum capability during a duty cycle. Like from SAR, you're talking about you build in this 15 to one buffer. Right, exactly. We plan not to fail. Right. That's, that's a big deal. And so that's why we go with more robust items. You know, you want to make sure that there is enough left over that past the normal duty cycle, that what you normally use it for, if it has to be pressed into service beyond that, that it will, you know, tolerate that and and not damage it's the. It's kind of like an insurance policy, really, if you look at it like that. Yeah, 
you know, because you're going to yep. use the tool. What if it does break? Well, and it, that's where I come into what I call the double loss theory, where everything in my pack, everything that I carry is its function. First and foremost, it has to buy me time at a future date. Yeah, this is a really interesting concept. Like, I, I want you to elaborate on that because we were talking about that in the car the other day when we were right. coming home from the event. And so would you just kind of dive into that a little bit? Because there is a loss. And I, right. I just kind of want you to dive into that to try to explain it to okay. the audience. Okay, the one resource that we cannot make or procure more of is time. That's the one thing that governs, that, that governs everything. Right. And so now we work a job and we trade that time for money. And right. then we take that money and we go buy gear that with the thought that it, when someday when we need it, it will perform. And at that point, we will get a, an, a return on the investment of time in the kind beginning. Kind of like paying it forward. Kind of paying it forward. Right. I can't fabricate a knife. I can't build a forge and fabricate a knife in the field on the go while I'm on the run. Contrary to what you see in the movies. <laughs> Right, and and making a uh, making a flint knife, we're, we're still talking about you have to have time to do that. So if I can bring a knife with me, then that's time and calories that I don't have to spend on the run. Not to mention finding the resources to go with it. Right, as well. And a, I'm sorry, but a flint knife will never outperform a steel knife. That was one no. of the upgrades from our our primitive ancestors that was leaps and bounds over not having it. Right. That was a game changer. So we, we take this time that we have right now, we work a job and then we buy the gear and we go out and then the gear fails. Well, now you've lost twice. Not only do you lose in the present moment when you needed that gear to perform, but you also lost the time in the past that you traded for money to get the gear. That's right. So that's my double loss double theory. Double loss. I mean, I really, really like that theory, <laughs> too. I've just never heard anybody say that before because we just write it off. We don't think about that. Yeah. But the loss is greater than what you could imagine at the very beginning of it. Right. Right? Because like you said, you paid for the tool, hoping that it would help you in this scenario, and then you get to that scenario and it fails. You know, and that that's what really sucks. Yeah. Right. Because in the future, if any of my gear fails, I'm going to think back to this moment right now and I'm going to say, dang it, I have lost twice. Yeah. And it's all Mike Simmons fault. Yeah. We, we try to bring you um, realistic information based on our real world experience, something that, that's logical. This is what we've experienced in the past. And for the past few years, we have tried to explore some of these other cool guy things. Exactly, yeah. We, we actually gave the effort. We tried these things, uh, common, uh, whatever the cool kids were doing at the time, and right. we keep coming back to these tried and true things. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the proof's in the pudding kind of thing. Now, well, not to say we're going back to, um, you know, wax canvas and, you know, uh, wool blankets and things. There's better equipment out there, but the same principle behind that. Yeah, and that's something that I pride ourselves in, like as a group, we think outside of the box. What we've done is we've said, okay, this is the way everybody's doing it right now. Right. Like he said, the cool kids are doing it this way, but maybe there's a better way. Like maybe let's take that off the table and let's start over. Well, I thought I was missing things. So when all of this you know, came out and what the cool kids are doing now, and this is the latest, greatest thing, it was so contrary to what I'd been doing my whole life. Absolutely. I was like, wow, am I missing something? Am I the problem? So I, I gave it, it's the college try. You know, I'm not only that, we actually went to other schools and we tried out right. those theories. Tried their well. method of teaching. Tried their method, yeah. You know, we're not going to mention names. No. Um, not today, but for a small price. <laughs> yeah. You can mail in. For, yeah, for a small price, we will let you know <laughs> so that you can avoid, you know. You three, got it right. There's three things that you can count on. And those, okay. those three things are gear fails, conditions change, and situations devolve. That's right. Those three things right there are the holy trifecta. <laughs> Say it one more time for the audience. Gear fails, conditions change, and situations devolve. That's right. And in the field, I call that the X factor. It's the thing that you couldn't plan for. I know y'all have heard me talk about that 
in, in previous videos before, but this is the stuff that you just don't plan on. It happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. So what we're working on is these fallacies. And the, the, the last one that I think we should cover, and we can go in more depth on each one of these if you want, but the, the last one I think we really need to highlight is the control fallacy. Oh, control. Right. And I want people to know that Control is an illusion. It is an illusion. Your your area of influence that you will be able to exact control over becomes very small. You know, I, I liken it back to, uh, you know, at our house, we can adjust the thermostat and we can control the temperature in that whole house. When things go sideways and inverted, you will be lucky to maintain your body core temperature. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you will be your lucky. Problems become a lot bigger but smaller <laughs> right, at the same time. Right. right. You will be lucky if you can treat a headache. Yeah, right. Oh man, the headache one. Yes. Like I, I cannot stress that one enough because I mean in class people are always like, oh yeah, well I can make aspirin. Yeah. Well, first you got to find the willow and the yopon. Then you got to create the medicine itself. That takes a whole nother 45 minutes or so at a minimum. Right. And then you got to take it and you got to wait another 45 minutes or so. Four to, four to six ounces at a time to make sure you don't have an yeah, allergic exactly. reaction. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and so carry a goodies powder. It's just that. <laughs> yeah. trade Is that the great truth that we're yes. bringing to the table yeah, right now? Uh, trade your time now for a goodies powder and then take that with you to the future, and it will save you six hours of having to make a caffeinated drink off the landscape. The devil is in the details. These are, it's the small things yes. that really matter, though. And but I'll, talk about control, because right. we're, we're getting off topic well, here. Well, the, the fallacy is uh, planning as, as an effort to exert... Uh, an amount of control on a future situation. And I want you to know that the truth of it is, is you will have control over virtually nothing. Nothing. And I'm not saying don't plan. I'm not, I'm not saying don't have a plan. And I'm not saying don't have bug out routes and things like that, but we need to understand that when it happens, you will not be able to go where you want to, you will go where you can. And um, you know, you, there may be an obstacle in your path and you want to go around it, but the path you have to take because of external factors is through it. And I think it's important too, because there's probably somebody watching right now and they're gonna say, well, this is the whole reason why you have a pace plan. Right. Right, but right. what happens when the pace plan doesn't work out? <laughs> Situations devolve. Right, like, oh my God, I had this bug out route planned and there's where my survival cache is, but I can't get to that one. And I remember watching TV or YouTube and they said, make sure you had multiple routes to multiple right. caches but I didn't do it. Right, spider points. What am I gonna do? Right, you know, <laughs> what am I gonna do? And, and so you're gonna have to, that's one of the benefits of planning. It's, it's like having a football playbook. Right. You can have things that you can call up at a moment's notice instead of having to formulate that plan right then. So, you know, we're gonna run 23 right or whatever. Whatever it is, right. right. And know, I think and there's so, so many people out there that, I mean, we're planners. Right, right. Yeah. We, we we are definitely planners to the minute detail. But some people are so OCD about it; they've got it all figured out. Right, and they think that they think that they are going to be able to exact control on that situation, and that's just not possible. It takes a platoon-sized force to exact control on a situation. Oh, that's another thing too, like single man <coughs> versus a team, or right. a family, or a group, yeah. or or whatever you want to call it, uh, right. because you have to have multiple contingency plans. And that's that. where your gray man comes in. Right. Sometimes the route that you have to take is through the hot zone. <laughs> Whether you want it to be Whether or not. Whether you want it to or not. And so therefore you have to have your gray man on point. But that was something that I kept on the bottom of the list, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but it was on the list. It that's was on the, the list, right. And so it's much easier to take that and bump it up in priority because it is there. Well, I think that all goes <clears throat> back to figuring out whatever your weak points are. Because right. I mean, we definitely, we know where our weak points are in ours. And so we right. actually seek out the training, letting somebody else take the steering wheel for us and just see if we can make it happen under those conditions. And we tried that, yeah. And we were able to perform, we survived, you know, yeah. and all this stuff. And, and But the thing of it is, survival is such a low goal to set. Like that's <laughs> right. the Existing. bare minimum. We're talking about survival is the perpetuating of a heartbeat. Oxygen in, oxygen rule out. Rule number red, one. Yeah, oxygen in, oxygen out, blood, uh, uh, red juice goes round and round. <laughs> Stays in the bottle. <laughs> right. That That's survival. Right. And that limits us as to what else we can do. If we're focused on maintaining just that bare minimum, 
then there's nothing, nothing else that we, you know, we can't be assistance to somebody else. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, I mean, don't get monkey butt. If you right. can't save your own ass, <laughs> can't save somebody else's, right? And right. just don't die and do no harm. I think for me, being in the field, I mean, the number one thing I heard was I never thought it would happen to me. And the problem is that people survived the actual incident, whatever right. it was. I would get onto a scene and they would survive that incident. And then all of a sudden they say things like, man, I'm thirsty. And FEMA's not going to be here for two weeks. Right. <laughs> right or man i'm getting hungry or i'm getting a little bit chilly now i'm soaking wet right whatever the case may be and i that's where i feel like all of the survival stuff really kicks in is post the event happening well itself. that's where you come into so you reach that situation and now you're in a survival situation right and you you will not do what you want to you will do what you have you to. have to do and it doesn't matter whether you're injured, whether you're tired, whether your brain's firing on eight, all eight cylinders or not, you will right. perform or you will die. That's right. And, and I don't want to be in that situation. And when, when I choose, when I want to make a move, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm in a observation post. I've just decided to set up right here and I'm going to look, listen, and I'm, I'm going to smell and see what's going on. And so at that point, I don't want to move unless I want to, but there, if you're not properly prepared, then you can be forced to move and right. it may not be your opportune time. And that's when your experience is key. Yes. Because I see the problem today is, is the survival triangle. A lot of people don't realize it. It's an inverted pyramid. And at the bottom of it is gear. Right. And then on top of that is uh, knowledge, right? They feel like if I have this knowledge, if I read these books, if I watch these videos, then when the time comes, as long as I have the gear, I'll be okay. Right. And then after that, is experience and skill sets, right? And then on top of that is will. And the problem is everybody hinges their theory on this pyramid that is gonna topple over because they right. put all this faith in the gear itself. And when the gear fails, and that's one of the things about this better than nothing, um, this better than nothing fallacy is a lot of times people, if they didn't have this thing, they would never have put themselves in that situation to begin with. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. They would have made one. different choices, right? right? And so they this this thing gets you far enough out there on a limb that when failure happens, it's catastrophic. It's no longer, you know, something happened in the backyard and, and we can go to the house. Uh, people really venture out far and then <clears throat> the suffering begins. <laughs> well, I think that's what a fallacy is, right? It's having a unsound idea that's based on unsound reasoning exactly. or logic, right? Exactly. And so whatever the cool kids are running today, it usually typically is a brand right. or even a method of survival, some kind of, uh, how do I say this without being whatever? Oh, I know, right? Um, like a list, let's say, or a way that they remember something, right. uh, which is prevalent in our industry. Uh, but the problem is, I mean, we have seen it in the field. We have seen yeah. all of this expensive gear fail in the field, but it's the cool thing to have, right? Right. It's the name brand. Like if I have this awesome brand and I, you know, this guy is running it because I saw him run it without the experience, right? which I think is a huge thing because if you don't have the experience, you don't know when the tool can potentially fail. You won't know the signs, the feel, of something before it fails. And even then, you still have manufactured defects. Right, you can't see that. You, you can't see that, that there was a, uh, uh, some kind of defect in the steel manufacturing thing like that. To counteract these fallacies takes experience. You right. don't know what you don't know. Right. And so I hope that we can inject some of our experience and, and dispel some of those for you so that you don't have to go through the same learning process. These are really three good fallacies that you've brought up. And I'm sure the audience, while we were talking, they probably had something in their minds as well. Sure. So, you know, what do y'all think some of the fallacies of survival are out there? We'd like to see that in the comments. Yeah, let us know. I mean, and if there's something specific that you want, something that you're questioning and you, you don't know, then hit us up in the comments and we'll be glad to address that. If it's something that we can't re reply to and, and give you a good answer in text form, then we'll make a video about it. I know a guy. I know a guy. <laughs> we can make that happen. <laughs> so if you're if you're honey smack digging the video, then like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell. And until next time, keep fueling those fires.